2003, 2001, when we saw Halo, my friends and I, we were like, ooh, it's crashing, it's buggy, it sounds terrible. It seemed like Microsoft bit off more than they could choose. And each build, it didn't seem to be improving at all. Like at some point it wasn't about making Halo perfect. Honestly, we were just focused on how do we get this thing on disc in time for launch. There was an incredible pressure on Halo. This is our lead title and this is what we've got. If this thing fails, it would all be for nothing. Xbox was finished. There's a new contender in the video game wars. Xbox is going to be the future. Truly the future of video games. Xbox. Taking over the living room. Limitless, connected, digital entertainment. You guys never understood. The company is going to face fierce competition. Sniper! <gasps> it's a ticking time bomb. It makes me very nervous to actually play this for you. Xbox getting a major overhaul. A bold vision for the future of gaming. Xbox! Soon, you will be food. On Halo, we were doing the thing that people weren't quite sure would even work on a console, a first-person shooter, and the frame rate was terrible. Come on, make my day! All of a sudden, we were in a new area, console games, and what do we know about console games? I had only heard things about, you know, it's not very good, really. Bungie may be a, a good studio, may be a fine studio, but the game wasn't really being received that well. We're gonna make it, aren't we, sir? With Halo and Xbox's fates intertwined, something drastic had to be done to get the game right. So, in a last-ditch effort, Ed Freeze and Bungie essentially put the development team under arrest. Ed Freeze had put Halo behind the curtain and won't let anybody see it won't let anybody talk to the Bungie team. He's like, you guys seal yourself off, literally and metaphorically, and deliver a great game. Like, our doors, I don't even think Ed could get into some of the Bungie doors. I kept saying, hey, Ed, you know, when can I play Halo? And he goes, well, not yet. When we only had a couple more months before, we had to get this thing into boxes. Good to see you, Master Chief. Things aren't going well. We had to stand up a complete game that was performant on new hardware. We had to create a compelling story with characters. We had to cut levels, take shortcuts. Just a mad rush of long days, sleeping under desks, full on old school crunch to get this game done. Oh, that's hurt. There it is. Hurt. The one positive thing that comes out of crunch is ideation and invention and polish. Ultimately, that was one of the things that Bungie took very, very seriously was Polish. For us at Bungie, this was a passionate effort to make the best game possible. But when you show up as Microsoft, you are open to a whole different level of, of criticism. Yeah, that's cool. All right. And Halo had the burden of showing up excellent in all ways. We had no idea Halo was going to be a hit. We hope people would like it. Here we go. Hold it up! But the rubber hits the road when you meet the gamer for real. very vividly going to local launch events. Hold it up! Starting to look at chatter online with fan sites, and then game reviews, and then comments, and realizing, oh my god, people like it. How the hell are we gonna beat this game? <laughs> Halo, which had problems entering the fray, came out on day one, and it was amazing. <laughs> it was really amazing. I just felt that sense of possibility. Damn it, Jenkins! Fire your weapon! That you could go anywhere and do anything on this beautiful, lush planet filled with things that were trying to kill you. They just did it so well. The controls felt natural. You could tell like that it was gonna be a breakthrough for first-person shooters. 
I didn't care that I wasn't using a mouse. I was using a controller. I was in the Halo universe, and it was fantastic. It was a bit of an epiphany of, oh, like, you can do that? Like, you can play this kind of game on a console? Awesome. Halo was a phenomenon. That dual player mode was wow. Landing on the beach with a warthog trying to protect Marines with Master Chief. It just blew me away, man. Banshee on flames comes down and lands on the ice and is skidding towards me across the ice. And it's going to run me over and kill me. And it skids to a stop right in front of me. And I live. It was like I was there. It was like I had that experience. Somebody go to a warthog. With Halo, Microsoft had that platform-defining title that you had to go out and buy an Xbox if you wanted to play. And that was something that I always envied and admired. Halo forms so much of the backbone of, I think, what Xbox is. Watching the feedback we were getting on Halo, the stories people were telling, it was a cultural moment. You getting Halo? Oh, yeah. Good. Just checking. <laughs> Without Halo, you know, we're not here. Halo Combat Evolved. Microsoft estimated that they have sold one million copies of Halo in the U.S. alone. 50% of Xbox owners are also Halo players. Xbox was the Halo box. That's what made it work. Halo broke ground in so many ways, in game control, camera control, storytelling, even art style. It inspired a lot of people to tell a different kind of story. It changed the game for Xbox, but I also think it changed the way we look at first-person shooters. First-person shooters had only really largely existed at scale on PC, and mapping those controls to the controller, they just did it right. It just felt right. No one had done it that well before. No one had nailed it. They just nailed the controls. So before Halo came out, the conventional wisdom was if you wanted to play a shooter, you had to do it on a PC, because that's where you would have the precision with the mouse and keyboard to aim, make the small movements to land that headshot on your enemies. What Bungie did with the help of Microsoft's playtesting and user research labs was figure out how to get something that would approximate that feeling on a console where all you have is the two sticks to move and aim. They weren't the first to do a shooter on the console, but they did it best by far. And the influence of what Microsoft and Bungie were able to achieve is still being felt in games today. Even today, it's the largest genre in console gaming. And really because of Halo, Xbox became the console for first-person shooter fans. The multiplayer was transcendent. It was just something that you didn't experience on any other platform. Microsoft made a huge bet on broadband. Every single Xbox had an Ethernet port in the back, and it paid off in spades. You could use it for LAN parties and to system link on a LAN. Oh my God. PC gamers understood the joy of the LAN, the local area network. You make a network of computers in a local area, which means you have to be face to face and nose to armpit with gamers. Got the flag, I'm out the front. Oh, that's and it's a fun experience. You can all be in a shared virtual world and run around and do things that you couldn't through a modem just because you're all there connected and it's higher speed. Microsoft ushered that in for consoles. <laughs> Manually plugging machines together to play games was not a new concept, but it had always required a lot of technical know-how. Now, the communal gaming experience wasn't just for computer geeks. It was for everyone. Right now, we have this game going here, which is 16. Downstairs, I was just down there. They probably by now have at least a 16 game going on. They keep on bringing in more stuff, and it seems to be expanding. It was a communal party multiplayer atmosphere that you could have with a massive group of people and have multiple consoles all connected. We get together at like 8 a.m. and play 16-player Halo all the way till 8 a.m. the next day. I remember running an Ethernet cable up the stairs so I could have a friend bring his over and play. I go to my buddy's house, and we're on two different floors. We're in four different rooms because screen looking's a thing. Man, the fights were legendary. You looked at my screen. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. I can't. I can't see your screen. We'd 
make a little flyer at work, like Halo LAN party this Saturday, bring an Xbox, bring a controller, bring a TV. That changed everything about my social life for probably 10 years. And these, by the way, weren't small TVs. These were the big cathode ray TVs that you had to find a way to be able to use. I had a heavy ass TV. The flat screens weren't around back then. You got it? Yeah. So I bought a PT Cruiser just so I could get my TV around and my Xbox. That was a fashion statement to have an Xbox in the car back in the days with that big screen. Give me a second, give me a second. Your foot, your foot. I know that's all split. I remember playing nonstop and sitting there in my own puddle of sweat. The minute you stepped into a multiplayer match on Halo, time just disappeared. You just got sucked in and we would play all night long. It provided me an experience I had never had on a console before, period. Halo was a runaway hit that had spawned its own social scene, putting Microsoft in the big leagues with Sony and Nintendo for the first time. But the team wasn't done. They saw a way to take those multi-room raucous LAN parties and make them global. Sniper, sniper! Oh, no. The initial concept for Xbox Live was one of those magical ideas. So it gets to go in a special folder that I call epic pitches because they're pitches that even though they were in their infancy, they planted a seed of ideas that turned into something that had an impact on the entire industry. Maybe an impact on global culture. We built an ethernet port in every unit. And the idea was is now we can actually have a network community of gamers from living room to living room around the world, no matter what language you speak, no matter where you are in the world, and we can all be part of one bigger community. And that vision was like, awesome. Yeah! There definitely was some skepticism about the idea of playing multiplayer games over the internet. When we were scrambling to get Xbox done, and Xbox Live is like a vague fog in everybody's head. Nobody knew how that was gonna work and whether it was gonna be a good ecosystem and whether the quality would ever be there. And it became a huge point of tension in terms of how it was designed and how it was gonna work. But we're gonna do it. Microsoft is putting literally billions of dollars on the line to back us, but the program was fraught with risk. It required technology that really hadn't been built anywhere in the industry before. And those kind of tech investments are always, always risky. With so much riding on the success of Xbox Live, the team couldn't afford to develop it in a corporate vacuum. If they wanted to deliver a gaming experience unlike any other, they needed gamers to tell them exactly what they wanted. We went out and talked to a whole bunch of gamers around the United States. One of the things that came back was that voice communications was going to be imperative. You know, it is a good day to die, cheesemaker. Nobody wanted to sit there and text with a typewriter, just taking out their buddies. First thing was you had to get the starter kit. It had a headset in it. It's like... You were talking about console gaming. What are you supposed to do with a headset? The Xbox communicator. It lets you talk to other gamers while you're playing. This broke down the barriers of how you could speak. You simply banged on your headset, and you could talk to anybody in the world that was on the platform. Defense is offensive. Defense is offensive. Building that global couch where people can talk and kind of virtually elbow each other with four gamers on four continents and have it all perfectly fluid through headsets, just as if they were sitting in the same room together. This was before Skype. So the notion of low latency, great quality voice, we had to go build out that tech. I like this one. Your, your, your own digital personal ID remembers your moves. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah. We're creating this giant gaming universe for gamers to play in over generations. We knew it was important to have this one identity uh, that linked to you where you could build your legacy in gaming. Your gamer tag. It's your identity on Xbox Live. The legend you build for yourself in this brand new gaming universe. Remember, you're building all your stats and friends in that name. Rather than have a gamer tag for Madden, a separate gamer tag for Halo, it's like you just want to be known as one thing. My gamer tag is the real B. My gamer tag is Cowboy 22. A gamer tag is hero protagonist. It's King Doug. The Space Man. Xbox Live wanted to bring that fundamental instant fun into the world of online gaming. You will never be without a game to play. 
any time, day or night. It was a revolution in online gaming. The team was finally feeling confident. They had the technical know-how to build Xbox Live. But on the other side of that challenge was another, even bigger question. If they built it, would gamers pay for it? The technology was in the box, but the commitment from a player, we just didn't know how it was gonna fly. That firstly, someone's gonna pay 50 bucks a month for broadband, but they also have to go tell their friends that it's worth it. Uh, I've never been shy to share my opinion. And there was one time where I was talking to Jay and we ended up arguing about it all the way into the hallway. And it was me saying, this Xbox Live idea you have is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Like, I hate this idea. Somebody's gonna pay $50 for, for multiplayer games when they can get it for free. And people did laugh at that and said, There's, why would you pay for access? Because you're already paying for your game. It wasn't just me. It was like an entire division worth of people saying, what are you nuts? So this experience had to be amazing. That was crazy to people. Like, who's gonna play multiplayer if they have to pay for it? Microsoft is taking the Xbox game system to a whole new level. Xbox Live. Future of video games arrive today. Microsoft is putting the Xbox online. Today, the Xbox goes live. Manning is at his home in Indianapolis, Hasselbeck at his in Seattle, and they're about to play each other in a video game using the Microsoft Xbox console. Oh, sit down. Son. Don't your coaches tell you you can't take a sack in the red zone? That is quarterback 101. Last night, we had gamers all over the country playing against celebrities here in LA where we had our big premiere party. We're checking the perimeter. All right, so here I go. Xbox Live launched exactly one year after the original Xbox itself launched, November 15, 2002. The launch of Xbox Live was almost like a second launch for Xbox. Blow up and kill everything in sight. Is that what you're getting? That's the idea, man. It's just like doing RoboCop. I'm gonna open up a can of whoop ass and see how it tastes. The two launch titles that I have such fond memories of, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon, which was a port of the PC game, and Mech Assault, which is a third-person action-oriented take on Mech Warrior. Just the light bulbs went off, just the magic was there. Live let us add the element of community and human society to game design. It was just immediately clear to me that this was going to be like the thing for video games. What Live did for Xbox was it created this community that once you got into it and attached to it, it was very hard to leave. I met so many people online playing games that I never would have been cool with based off of us playing each other, me beating him, him beating me, him having some great plays. And there's an extraordinary number of like 50 year old males that play Xbox Live together. And they will not go to another system because their buddies aren't gonna go. So they're only gonna buy a system to hang out with the guys so they can play while the kids are sleeping and they're gonna play Call of Duty or something, right? Every night, me and my homies be on a party with about 15 or 20 of us and we be talking <laughs> Talking about what happened in the day if we playing the game and it's just like a great gossip line for some grown ass men. We had forecasted how many Xbox Live subscribers we were gonna have, you know, month one, month two, month six, et cetera. Hey, we got 50,000. Hey, we got 100,000. Hey, we got a million. Hey, we got two million. It just kept growing. And that happened like, like, I wouldn't say instantly, but pretty damn close. It happened very, very fast. Xbox Live was unprecedented. Uh, everybody else's version paled in comparison. What you think of gaming today, being on a headset, talking with friends, playing games, that just seems commonplace now because it is commonplace now, but Xbox made that possible in a big way. Xbox Live could be considered one of the very first social media platforms. Before Facebook, even before MySpace, Microsoft really did pioneer the very first interactive, dynamic social platform. Quite frankly, Microsoft proved to the world that online multiplayer was going to be the key to the future. Gamers flocked to Xbox Live in numbers that even took optimists within Microsoft by surprise. But while the platform was teeming with newly devoted fans who loved sniping their college buddies from different continents, there was one consistent complaint. What happened to the game that put Xbox on the map? Where was Halo? When we started working on the second Halo game, the weight of expectation came crashing down on us. 
Halo 2 had to be a blockbuster movie. And that was always a danger is what if we just push to do this big AAA spectacle and miss the heart of what made Halo success in the first place. God damn, we have a lot of work to do between now <laughs> and E3. Everybody on the team had a different idea about what being more excellent would be. We loved that you could get into vehicles, for example, but it frustrated us that you couldn't like tear someone out of a vehicle and jump into their vehicle and take it over. So boarding vehicles became a huge design initiative. Look out! We were really good at coming up with great ideas. We weren't quite as good at production discipline and figuring out how to right size all those ideas, fit them into a box timeline and ship on time. When I got there, they had reached a point in development where they were basically gonna have to cut half the game and in some ways start from scratch on a lot of the promises that they'd made themselves. Within a year, it became clear it wasn't working. Just the way the game felt, Jason really wasn't happy with. He looked at the game, yes. and he came to me and said, you know, we have a problem. I'm gonna have to rework a bunch of the work, and it's effectively gonna add another year to the schedule. Jason, help. There was a lot of pressure. How can we ship a better game than Halo? And from Microsoft's point of view, Xbox's point of view, how can you ship that game as quickly as possible? This is now by far the most valuable franchise that we have, you know, this is Halo. We can't screw this up. Jason's saying he needs a new year. Time for me to step up and do my job as a boss. I do know that Ed went to bat for us. Ed was very much a purist. He was about creating great games and giving the dev teams the time they need. And that is at conflict sometimes with actually making a profit. <laughs> so to me, it was a no-brainer. But uh, Robbie wanted to put it in front of the other leads on the team because Halo was so important. It's going to affect, you know, the Xbox Live team and what they do. It would affect the continued marketing of the platform and things like that. Microsoft back then was a technology company. Software shipping on time at quality was a big part of the rhythm of the business. So we go in and we have the meeting and Robbie basically goes around the room and takes a vote. And it went around the room and everybody voted to keep it on the original schedule. I walked out of the room and basically I just threatened to quit immediately. Robbie gave in, he calmed me down and he agreed and he gave us the extra year for Halo 2. Ed got the Bungie team the time they needed to finish the game, but the delayed launch had a ripple effect throughout Microsoft. Really that Bungie meeting was the beginning of the end for me. When I walked out of there, it wasn't just that I was mad, it was the first time I could imagine leaving the company. I mean, I'd been there since I was in college. I had a lot of stuff going on in my life. About to turn 40, um, I had been at the company a long time and made plenty of money, so I didn't need to be there. Within the next six months, I quit. In January 2004, Ed Freeze resigned from Microsoft, while Bungie set out to finish what they'd started, creating a sequel to one of the most popular titles in console history. The extra year Freeze bought them turned out to make all the difference. Not only did it elevate the game, it built fan excitement to a whole new level. The lead up to Halo 2, I had never experienced anything like that in my life. It was genuinely a pop culture event, and I don't say that lightly. 7,000 stores are opening on midnight. They've been waiting a long time for this. They were chanting, Halo 2. Halo 2! Halo 2! Just felt like something new was going to happen in entertainment. Because Halo 2 is the best! Halo 2 is everything! Xbox's Halo 2 is expected to generate more revenue in 24 hours than day one sales of any full feature movie in entertainment history. Halo 2 is probably, you know, one of the biggest uh, phenomenon to ever hit my life and uh, a lot of people's lives. It was the biggest day in entertainment history. Halo 2 sold 2.4 million units in 24 hours. Here was a video game for the first time really crushing movies. 
it was a coming of age story for the video game industry. This game is simply the best game on the planet. I played Halo 2 with my friends literally every night for at least a year. That's how transformative Halo 2 was for me and what it did for Xbox Live. There had been nothing like that ever. With the innovative success of Xbox Live and a full-blown cultural phenomenon in Halo 2, it seemed like Microsoft's bets were paying off. Xbox was even surpassing Nintendo in US sales. On a winning streak, the team put their eyes on an industry-changing follow-up to the Xbox. When I arrived at Microsoft, it was my job to think about the way that the gamer was going to be using this two, three, four years after launch, and how do you continue to deliver content? We started then to plan this multi-billion dollar investment that became the Xbox 360. Xbox 360 is the new entertainment system that's designed around high def, wireless, and always connected. And it doesn't stop there. It's totally personalizable, so you can change the way it works and the way it plays and find your friends no matter what you're doing. When they unveiled the 360, I saw a very powerful console with a stunning interface, with a focus on, on being online, always connected. This was all stuff that they had sort of experimented with with the original Xbox and Xbox Live, but now they were building it into the core experience of the console. Xbox 360 was five to 10 times more powerful than the original Xbox. To achieve that, we had to push technology and solutions that didn't exist in the previous generation. We had to go explore things that had never been done. As opposed to leveraging a lot of off-the-shelf components and existing technologies, we're actually building a brand new processor and chipset for this particular console. So we're taking a lot more of that engineering effort on internally. At the heart of the Xbox 360 are three IBM CPUs. Whatever you'd heard about the PlayStation 2, the motion engine, you know, whatever big wild dreams you had created in your head, we needed to create a leapfrog product that said, hey, this is even more powerful. This is the most powerful console on the planet. And so we evolved the Xbox from a powerful console that plays all the games you love to a console that connects you to all your friends and connects you to a lifestyle, this digital entertainment lifestyle. We involved movies. We got content generated that you could access, music. The magic in Xbox 360 is it does so much more than the original Xbox did. Xbox 360 Guide, it is your launch pad to all of your digital entertainment. Here you can store your pictures, videos, and music. We've also added a new concept called achievements, sort of a record of everything you've accomplished across your entire library of games. With Xbox 360, we've created technology that will enable people from every age and every corner of the planet to gather together in new ways. A product with games at its core, surrounded by limitless connected digital entertainment. Everything we were trying to do had just never been done before. We're really focusing hardcore on building an online experience for Xbox around games. Gaming was always first, but this was no longer just the ability for you to play a game online. This was breakthrough thinking. We built Xbox 360 with a mission. They showed it as a media hub in your living room. You could connect other devices to it. You could play your photos. You could do this at the other. They targeted a broad range of gamers. They were building this thing to be future-proof. Microsoft's new Xbox 360 will be first to hit store shelves this fall. It's huge. It's a big, big statement for us. The next generation of consoles starts now. We wanted to try something new with the Xbox 360 launch. Xbox yeah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Favorite game. Woo! Where are you guys from? Did We're you from, from far? Well, yeah. from Indianapolis, Indiana. Yeah. Kansas City. Los Angeles. Los Angeles, Hollywood. I came in from Minneapolis. Atlanta, Florida. Yeah, yeah. That's the only way to get it on the 360. You hear me? Hey, this is Xbox Live's Major Nelson. We're here at Zero Hour in the Mojave Desert. Hey guys, you ready to go? Tonight marks the biggest gaming event of the year, and it starts right now. Zero Hour was this in-person fan experience in the desert in California. I was at G4 at the time, and I remember we got wind that they were just gonna throw an epic party for Xbox fans. Xbox 360, I'm hexed! We had a hangar 
in the middle of nowhere and decked it out with hundreds of gaming stations. We are seconds away from this hangar opening and all of these people getting a chance to play the Xbox 360. And as the doors start to open, like the biggest doors you'd ever seen, you knew that you're about to run in to what would be the future of gaming. Are you ready? And we basically said, hey, come here and you're gonna be the first to play games and we're gonna sell you consoles here as well. Thousands of gamers came, people that had met on Xbox Live that had never actually seen each other in person before. People were so happy. It was a magical launch event. Zero Hour event was a huge success, a massive celebration. We had so much pride in this product. Was this a transcendent moment for you? Oh, yes. The excitement generated in the desert spilled into the rest of the country as the console became available to the public on November 22nd, 2005. I waited in line in like freezing rain for like three hours outside this Best Buy to try and get a slip so I could get an Xbox 360. I was so stoked when I got it, I took a selfie. They had a great launch lineup. They had uh, the gamer in mind first. It had the features that I would want in a console. They had the games for casual gamers, for hardcore gamers. The Xbox 360 marketplace was where you could buy digital games. Sure, you had Steam and people could do it on PC, but this was a managed, curated portfolio, much like you know as an app store today. And we were one of the first ones to have it. I start downloading games, and I download Joust, Robotron, and Defender, and like, all of a sudden, everybody's having fun because these games are amazing. And I'm like, okay, we were sitting here at grandma's house and we were bored. And I just got on the internet and downloaded games. And now we're playing video games and having fun. Uh, uh. This is the future. This is the greatest thing in history. And this is what this console transition is about. I can view my profile so I can see, you know, what games I've got. And it's got the whole achievements thing here as well. It was the first console with achievements. We take that for granted now, but all the little bonus points and your gamer score and your rating. You achieved something in the game, and that something is whatever the developer decided. Hey, did you scale this mountain? Did you open this door? Did you find this thing? Somebody can play through the game, but if you wanted to really complete it, you had to get every achievement. Let's get some ass. Yeah. I've got 148,000 gamer score. People are like, what is that? Why do you, why do you care? Because it's something that reminds me of all the time that I've had, all the games that I've played, all the, the... I feel like I've accomplished something. They had an incredible console that was built for always online, always ready, with a stunning interface that ran on top of everything, and uh, they came out guns blazing. We had low price, with high def, with great games, uh, and a product that was great. And so we felt we had a chance that generation. Yeah, we were riding high, we were celebrating, morale is extremely high. They had arrived. They had to gain the trust of developers, they had to make a statement with the gamers, uh, they had to show that they belonged at this party, and the 360 was a beautiful iteration of all the lessons that they had learned with the original Xbox. I think 360 was finally that moment that Jay and Seamus and everyone, you know, dreamed of. Gamers were looking to see whether we would get it right this time. And we thought that we did. We needed to be seen as the start of the next generation. And this all needed to come together flawlessly. Unfortunately, that's not quite what happened. This is called an E74 error. Contact Xbox customer support. It was in the forums and I started to notice that something wasn't right. I think there's something going on here. The criticisms that we're reading about are coming from the games press who are hearing from gamers who are saying, I'm having a problem with my box. You feel the top of the Xbox, it's pretty hot. We can hear retailers starting to say, there's an issue here with 360, Microsoft had built something amazing and special, but this problem was something what the f that could kill the Xbox and all the work that they had done to get to this point.